Raheem, how are you? I'm, I'm great, Tony. It's really, uh, it's amazing to be able to sit here with you 10 years after a Superstorm Sandy. You know, we were lived through that together and in kind of very different roles. So just kind of, you know, as a preamble, I know you remember, but uh, it was a strange situation for me because we didn't communicate all that much during it because you were in the command center as the lead. And I was the lead clinician in the building down in the ED, which at that point was where the bulk of the patients were. And uh, I was communicating mostly with the people that were around you because they, one of the first things they teach you in Hicks is never talk to the guy in charge because he's got a million people trying to talk to him. But I do remember vividly some of the interactions I'm curious about, and I've always wanted to ask you about, and yet we never really got around to it, is if you take five steps back and you realize what you're doing, you're essentially in a command center, and then there's another small command center a few miles away trying to make sure the people of Staten Island still have health care. What is that, you know, it's kind of surreal, right? What are you thinking at that moment as that's actually going on? Well, it is absolutely surreal, and it's a pleasure to be here with you 10 years later. It, it was interesting because you're, you're preparing for all this your entire career. Uh, 40 years in healthcare, faced with a number of different things. Uh, in my tenure as president and CEO of Staten Island University Hospital, one of my first challenges was the ferry crash. So you learn to kind of, not that you disconnect from what's going on around you, you have to stay connected to people's needs and what's going on. And the ability to keep calm at a period of time when you know that you are needed as a leader, you are needed as someone to coordinate efforts, more importantly, I think, to coordinate the efforts, but you prepare for this. So we learned a lot from the ferry crash in, 2003. I'll never forget that date. It was October 15, 2003. We learned from the experience that we had in terms of evacuating both hospitals at the order of Mayor Bloomberg uh, in 2011 in preparation for Hurricane Irene. And we wound up being prepared in terms of what we needed to do getting ready for Superstorm Sandy. And we had plenty of warning. So what's most important when you step back and you look at this is that you want to make sure that you are surrounded by the people who are appropriate to deal with the emergency. You want to make certain that the people in those jobs know what they're doing without having oversight through the entire process, that they can react quickly. And you rely on their judgment at any given point in time to rely on their responding to a predicament without having to pick up the phone and say, what do I do? I was confident that I was surrounded by the right people and the right resources. So it's interesting you brought up the fact that I think it really kind of leads to the most important question, actually. If you think about it, when the bridges are open, Staten Island University Hospital serves about two thirds of the health care for the borough of Staten Island. Once the bridge is shut down, that number goes above three quarters, right? If, you, if that was to actually occur for an extended period of time, there's no question. I think I'm now one of the few people around that understands the weight that you had to be feeling that potentially the two institutions that are serving potentially up to three quarters of the health care of Staten Island are at risk. And I remember that day vividly. And what I've really wanted to ask you about for years is when we were first there and we were watching this whole thing and we we're watching the water slowly come up, there was initially this sense of, oh, my God, what an amazing experience. And people were almost happy. You had to walk downstairs and tell people to go back in and and then there was those really eerie lights of the, of the fire trucks coming up Seabue Avenue, you know, that were on the, the tip of the water. And there was this, oh my gosh, moment where all of a sudden we all realized that this was no longer a, you know, photo op. And this was no longer Hurricane Irene. This was something different. And at that moment, the pressure you had to have felt, and that I now fully understand that, wow, Staten Island's at risk. What is that actually like at that particular moment in time? Well, we become more, in terms of the, the island being at risk, we become more than healthcare administrators in our community. We become part of the overall leadership of the borough of Staten Island. We are part of that. Uh, that's why it's important when you are in this role that you develop very strong relationships with the police department, with the fire department. Uh, you develop uh, strong relationships with all of the utilities, 
with National Grid, with Con Edison. You develop strong relationships with our local elected officials and our communities. This is all a very important part of what you do and, and what I did and what's called upon us. And the w one time when I realized that we are cut off from the rest of the world, we are more than just healthcare administrators, was that when the ferry crash occurred uh, in 2003, it wasn't all that long after 9-11, uh, albeit two years, it still was on the minds of a lot of people. And I happened to be in the office of Michael Dowling when we got word that the ferry had crashed and, and dozens of people were seriously injured. Michael put me on an ambulance to get me back to Staten Island because the belt was shut down. You could not go anywhere. And I was put in an ambulance with two drivers and they took me along sidewalks, the side of the street, up medians, to get and with the siren blasting so I could get back to the hospital. And when we got to the bridge, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, there were police there who wanted to make sure it was appropriate. Even though it was an ambulance, they stopped us to make sure that we needed to get to Staten Island. And that's when I realized that we truly were cut off from the rest of the world. Because of, because of what had occurred on 9-11, there was still that concern that it might happen again. And in order to secure the rest of the city, everything was shut down on Staten Island. You could not get on or leave Staten Island at that moment. It was the same type of thing that we needed to be prepared for in terms of Irene, which fortunately didn't become what we thought it would be. And we, we certainly experienced that with Sandy because Staten Island was in a low-lying area. And we needed to make sure we needed to keep our emergency room open, we needed to keep the hospital open, we needed to take care of the patients. Uh, sheltering them in place because we were expected to be cut off from the rest of the world. So at that point in time, that's what hit me. We need to be self-sufficient. We need to survive on our own if we're going to do our jobs properly. When Superstorm Sandy was approaching, you have said openly that, you know, the hospitals in these low-lying areas were included in the process of what was going to happen. And at the time, the decision had been made for all and that they were going to shelter in place. And you, unlike a lot of the other folks in your position chose to evacuate all of your patients who were on respirators and chose to evacuate all of your neonatal ICU patients. And in retrospect, if you, you've seen some of those terrible images in other hospitals of, of little babies uh, being, being taken through uh, darkened uh, stairways, it's just another example of going above and beyond and what went into that decision. I am not a medical doctor. And when I talk about relying on people who are well trained to be in their positions, whether it's providing care at the bedside or a clinician in a leadership role in the organization, it's important to surround yourself with the people who know the right decision to be made. I am fortunate to have served as the president of Staten Island University Hospital with leaders, medical leaders, medical administrators like yourself, like Ted Maniatis, like Ted Strange, and I could go on and on and on, Joe McGinn, uh, who were at the time the medical leaders and all of the chairs of the departments, but I know that I could rely on every one of them to support me with the right decision. And if you recall, and I'm sure you're still doing it now, we held regular monthly meetings with all of the chairs. We got to know each other as not only colleagues, but as friends and people we could rely on. So when the point came that I'm being ordered by the Commissioner of Health of the State of New York, the Commissioner of Health and Mental Hygiene of the City of New York, and the Mayor of the City of New York, I am being ordered first to evacuate with Irene and then to shelter in place with, with Sandy. At that point in time, I rely on my medical leaders. I'm not at that point in time just f simply following orders from the mayor or from the health commissioner. I'm going to my medical leaders and I'm asking what we should do. And the decision was made that we needed to transfer the most vulnerable patients of the hospital. So as an answer to your question, it's important to surround yourself with the right people, the people with the know-how of how to get things done. And the beauty of a company like Northwell is, if I remember correctly, and it wasn't even Northwell at the time, it was still North Shore LIJ, we, once we'd made that decision, we were able to get all those people off island to another Northwell facility, maintain the process. People forget how hard it was to get a vehicle to take any kind of patient anywhere. So we were really able to um, focus in on our own efforts to do this without trying to stress the city and the state at that one moment. 
you just getting back to your question about Staten Island for Staten Island and understanding that, you know, there are times um, where you do have to be self-sufficient and be able to maintain that. There was that moment in time where we were surrounded by water, mm -hmm. right? And I'm going to ask you in a second about that feeling of it's really hard to understand how we didn't flood. There was this moment where, okay, it looks like we're going to survive this, but right now for the next few hours, uh, we have to figure out how to help Staten Island. And I remember a phone call I made to the command center, and you actually called me back, where I was offering to send three or four doctors for, for a period of a day or two to Richmond University because we weren't sure what the volume was going to be like. Our volume came back way quicker than we thought, but we didn't know that the first night. So we were sitting there wondering what was going to happen. And I remember your response, and your response to me was, if they can give them privileges, of course you can send them. And it was a forget that we're competing, forget this. It's Staten Islanders for Staten Island because that was that moment where you have to do the right thing. So in the relationships that I mentioned in terms of community leaders, in terms of elected officials, police, fire, we also, it's important to develop a, a good relationship with, for essence, in all essence, our competitor. Uh, but we don't think as competitors. They're providing care for the, uh, for the same people that we provide care for. And again, friends, loved ones, neighbors fit in all those categories at some point or another, and we're responsible for their care. And as you indicated earlier, for most of the people of Staten Island, majority of people of Staten Island prefer to get their care on Staten Island. The, it didn't, I didn't even hesitate at that moment. And, and to your credit, coming forward and saying, we could do this. That's all that mattered. As long as we could do it, and as long as we would be able to have the supply, and we provided Rumsey with supplies yeah. as well, right? Yeah. Richmond University Medical Center uh, was continuing to provide care. They were not one of the hospitals that were considered for evacuation at any point in time because of their location, but they did need supplies. They did need personnel to help support them. We were continuing to provide care to our patients but we had the ability to help them because we had the resources to help them. And at that point in time, you never think about, well, why should we help? We help because we have the same mission, and that's providing care to the people of Staten Island. So it didn't take a lot of effort to, to agree with you and say, what a great idea, let's do it. 